happy to have the privilege of coming in thy presence and to meet with thee. And, O oh God, may we have fellowship tonight around the written word. Yes. May the Holy Spirit inspire all that's done or said. For the glory of God, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. They almost caught me off a guard. I was looking down here at a little Arkansas brother that from way down in that great state of Arkansas. And what you doing up here in this cold country anyhow? <laughs> well, uh, everywhere I go, I meet people from Arkansas. It was one of my first places to go to after I left St. Louis, where we was at the Keele Auditorium and went down into Arkansas. And I'll never forget those people, how they come, oh, just, they was 28 thousand people, the newspaper said, in Jonesboro, and the city's about eight or ten thousand, I guess, population. For thirty miles around the city was nothing, all the farmhouses taken up and tents built and things and people living in it. Under old old trucks and people raining, it'd be raining and people holding little pieces of, of canvas and newspapers over their sick folks just waiting for him to be prayed for. It didn't make any difference if he got in this week or next week. Whenever it was, it'd be all right, see. Now, I remember down at Carning. You live close to there, do you, Carning? Uh, you've seen, I've seen something there that I guess that maybe Dwight Moody or Sinky or some of those seen in their days. I was way out in the wilderness. I'd pull back and was back there praying alone before the service. I'd see people coming out those dusty roads going down to the service long in the afternoon. And I noticed young ladies, beautiful young ladies, not over 16, 18 years old, packing their shoes and stockings under their arm. Before they would get there, they'd sit down, dust off their feet, and put on their holes in their shoes. They only had one pair, and it had to last. But they really loved the Lord. Some of the most outstanding miracles I have ever seen done in America was did there. And I want to come back to Arkansas one of these days. <laughs> Just have a real old time of fellowship around the Word and the people of God. Now, we're just a little early tonight, and so we're going to read some of God's eternal Word as usual. And I want to say, I believe they said here we had a... You done now, that ministerial breakfast and so forth. Yeah, no, okay, that's all right then. We want to read tonight out of the book of Genesis, and I want you to listen as we read out of the 11th chapter and the 5th verse. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, the people are one. I want to speak tonight on the oneness of unity. Now, as we go straight into the Word for this exhortation, and now I, it's very amazing to think that how that the people that they saw here was one. And you know, that's God's plan. God wants people to be one. And it's strange to think, but the devil tries to put his plan into existence and make the people one under his plan. Now, God has a plan, and the devil has a plan. And then... The devil is trying to get all people under his plan while God's trying to get people to be one under his plan. So there's two great spirits in the world. One of them is the devil. The other is God. The devil has messengers. God has messengers. And we are at liberty to make our choice to whom we will yield ourselves to, that's whose servants we are. 
But if you notice, as I was preaching last Sunday of the thirst that's in people, man, God made man to thirst, but to thirst after him. That's why thirst was placed in a man. But the devil comes along and perverts that and causes the people to thirst after him with the things of the world. The Bible said, if ye love the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Then you see the devil perverts. He can't create anything, but he can pervert what God has already created. The devil is not a creator. He's just a perverter of the original creation. And what is sin is righteousness perverted. How many understands that? Good. i just wondering. I'm a southerner, and I, we just used to a little more response than that. And the, the northern people are conservative, and, and I've been in the south so long that I just have to get used to my southern ways or me or Yankee ways. But I want you to know we won the war. <laughs> yeah, we got no argument about that. There's one Southerner living and no Yankees, so we won the war. <laughs> I thought it was most striking when that uh, little Yankee was dying, oh, and the Southerner sent him a telegram and said, God bless you, Yankee. I hope to see you again pretty soon. That's why I couldn't have thought that in the beginning, you see, and just let it go. But I like to say that, that there's only it taken the spans of life to win the war, but we finally got it, see. All right, but there is a great time coming. And now, speaking of the, the enemy, of how that he perverts righteousness into unrighteousness. Now that we're a mixed multitude, both men and women, most all adults, so I'm sure you'll understand, you listen to your doctor and I'm your brother. It's legal and lawful and godly for a man to take himself a wife and to live with this wife. But another woman could be the same thing to him, but it would be death to touch her. There's the difference. Righteousness perverted. That's the way all sin is, is righteousness perverted. God made you to thirst after him. And God made the church to be oneness under his dominion. But the devil makes them oneness under his domain. And now if you'll notice, in the Mohammedan religion, some of the things, if we would just could take the time, the things that are, how they are perverted in the Mohammedan religion, which I've had the privilege of visiting the country near the grave of Mohammed, and at his grave has been a white horse, has been standing there for 2,000 years. Every four hours, I think it is, they change the guard. And a white horse saddled and waiting for the resurrection of Mohammed. And they say that he'll raise from the dead, get on the horse, and conquer the world. Then you see, they are watching for the conqueror to come riding on a white horse. And how that is perverted from the Scriptures because Jesus is coming riding on a white horse. His vesture dipped in blood, his name the Word of God. But you see, the devil taken that theory and perverted it to Mohammed. But truly, Jesus will come on the white horse. The Bible says that he will. And you can get in any false cult that you wish to, and you see many great symbols of true Christianity. 
Now, in the Tower of Babylon, if you'll notice that tower, it was the beginning, Babylon, which I will speak on later this week, the Lord will. Babylon, the very city, was patterned out of heaven. And in there they had the river Euphrates flowing right by the throne. And the garden, swinging garden. And that's patterned off of heaven. For the river of life flows by the throne of God. And you see, the achievement that man was doing was making a pattern, perverted. And then in this great thing, they had a man by the name of Nimrod. And Nimrod was bringing all the rest of the cities and the nation under one great dominion, showing that it's a man-made theory, just a pattern. But God's church is united under God. Man has nothing to do with it. It's united under God. And this Babylon, which was the beginning of, uh, in the creation, in the Genesis, we find out that it's plumb over in Revelations. And it speaks of the ecclesiastical world in the last days, which is now, will find it unite under the Antichrist, a man-made religion. But I'm thankful to say that God's church will be united too, under one head, God. But the man-made religions will all come into this Antichrist religion. There'll be two forms of them. One form will come from Rome, which will be the beast. And there is an image unto the beast, which will be the ecclesiastical head of the Protestant church, heap up as an image unto the beast under the denominational world. And it'll all come under one great dominion. And the Antichrist will be the one that's enthroned and seated, anti, against, Almost exactly like, but yet his, his, his teaching isn't from the Scriptures. Enough of the Scriptures to make it look like that it's right, but it'll be wrong. And I know you're, you're saying, Brother Branham, you're referring to Rome now. That's exactly, and not only Rome, but Protestantism too. It's exactly the Bible said so. But there you are. The devil... Uniting people under one head, one ecclesiastical head, a man on earth. The Bible said he would sit in the temple of God, showing that he is God. And how he would wear a triple crown and all these things that he would do. The vicar of, of heaven, earth, and purgatory. And under this would be a, an image to him where all the rest of them would unite together. But the church of the living God will be united under the power of God and the supervision of the Holy Spirit. God's church shall be united. Oh, aren't you glad in this dark hour when everything's shutting off, people are not caring they don't seem like their hearts are getting farther and farther away from God. The world's getting colder and colder and indifferent because these great ecclesiastical heads are forming up. In Russia, Russia is trying to unite the world under communism. Russia... The devil that's controlling Russia is trying to unite all the world under communism. They'll never be able to do it. And then 
the UN, United Nations, is trying to unite them under a union police force. Another man-made system. It never will work. It can't. But they're all trying to. And let me say this with respect, but according to the Word of God, that every nation today is dominated by the devil. The Bible said so. Satan showed our Lord the kingdoms of the world, and he said, these are all mine, to do with them anything I want to do. And if you worship me, I'll give them all over to you. And Jesus knew that he was going to fall heir to them in the millennium, so he said, get thee behind me, Satan! If the world was governed by Christ, we'd stack arms and there'd never be another bullet fired. We wouldn't have any use for Sputniks and for hydrogen bombs to blow up people. When Christ takes over the governorship of this world as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the people will be united to him under one great big domain. It'll be a time all nations are wanting people to be one. Germany thought they all ought to be Germans. Russia thinks they all ought to be Russians. The Western world thinks they ought to come under here. And they want them to speak one language, just like they did in Babylon. God said they are one language. And he wants them all to speak one language. They want them all to be one united person. But it will never take place under man's dominion. But I'll say this. That there's coming a time when all nations will be united together under one king, and that will be Jesus Christ, God's Son. And they'll speak one language. They'll be one in heart and one in purpose. Daniel saw the end when the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and it rolled into the kingdoms of the world and crushed them, and they become like the trash on the floor, the husk that the winds blew away, but the stone covered all the earth. That stone is Christ. There will be some time, there will be one nation, one people, one flag, the old rugged cross. Praise be to the living God. My hopes is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. When all around my soul gives way, then he is all my hope and stay. For on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other grounds is sinking sand, all other grounds. Churches, denominations, nations, UNs, whatever it might be, it's all sinking sand. Got to come to an end. I've had the privilege of standing in Rome, where the great Caesar who tried to unite all the world under the Roman Empire. And today, you have to dig 20 feet down to find the ruins of that city. I stood in Egypt where the great pharaohs that tried to unite the world under Egypt. And you dig 20 and 30 feet to find the ruins of the city. Or here we have no continuing city, says the Bible, but we seek one to come. Not long ago, when I 
One time went out to a place when I was a little boy. I seen a great tree where I used to go and sit under that tree. And I said, when I'm an old man, I'll come back and sit under this certain tree. And I'll look up into its branches. And I will admire its beauty as I am today of a boy of twelve. There's nothing left of that tree but a snag. Why, there is nothing here that can continue. It must cease. And every mortal thing speaks of an immortal one coming. For everything that we see is a perverted act of something that's real. I marry a couple and see a lovely young girl in her blushing teens. A young man with his shoulders back, standing as they are one in their hearts beating together. I think, isn't that too pretty a picture to ever be marred by death? But it's just a few years till the hair turns gray, the shoulders stoop, and back to the dust they go. What is it? It's a picture when they're standing there that there is a land beyond the river where every symptom of death is taken away. There immortal shall stand in his likeness the sun and the stars to outshine. That great morning star hasn't lost any of its beauty since the Lord blowed it from his hands and hung it in its orbit. And look what a few years does to us but what did he say in the Scripture? He said, Those that have turned many to righteous shall outshine the stars. So we look for a city whose builder and whose maker is God. After you see this great something that I'm trying to build your mind into or a context I'm trying to let you see out here that there is a, a working of an enemy and the working of the enemy by a perverted spirit is trying to do that which the spirit of Christ is trying to do. The enemy is trying, like the pro and con, to unite all the world under one great head. The worlds are doing that. Russia, you in. And now let me go just a little further. And the church is trying to do it under man-made setup. It'll never work. It's not God's program. I could prove that by His Word. But you know... God made you a person to make you desire to be that way so that he could fill you up with his goodness. Now, if a man has to be full of something, that's right, this is a choosing time. You cannot stand neutral any longer. You may leave before the message is over, but you can't go out that door the same person you come in. That's right. You'll cross that threshold tonight either a better person or a, a more evil person than you was when you entered. You can't help it. It's up to you to make a decision. Now notice, it's a choosing time. You can't be neutral. It's a choosing time. You must choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And the devil has presented many things glamorous that you can choose if you wish to. You can't remain the way you are because you've got to be if you're empty. Now, I wish this to stay among us. And the good Lord of heaven knows that I'm not saying this to be indifferent. But I'm just saying this to show a truth. 
and our great evangelists who are crossing the world today. And not long ago, I had the privilege of sitting at the breakfast with this famous Billy Graham, who I believe is God's servant, going across the nations, calling them to Christ, calling the world to Christ and to repentance. And I heard him say before a group of preachers, as he picked up the Bible like this, and he said, this is the, the example. He said, Paul went into a city and he made a convert. He came back a year later and he had 30 converts. He said, I go into a city and have 20,000 converts. I come back in a year and don't have 20. Oh, how I wanted to say something. But that was his meeting. Billy Graham, with his message, is telling people to repent and to turn from sin. And that's an essential message. And God has chosen Billy Graham to do it. No one else can do it like he has done it. Because he's following the Lord. He is in the spirit of John, which before the first coming of Christ, went forth and preached repentance and done no miracles. But he preached and stirred the regions and made them ready for the next message coming. But today, as Billy Graham our beloved brother, as he's having the people to dump themselves out with sin, he hasn't got the message of filling up again. That's what's the matter. You are dumped out. But let me humbly speak to you as your brother. The Bible said when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man... He walks in dry places. In other words, he's going around everywhere trying to find rest. A spirit is not very bad until he can find somebody that he can talk to or live through. Just recently, I could feel the spirit in the meeting. And you all who are sending your letters in as an apology of the first night or two to believe that it was some kind of a mental setup, and now you're convinced. Sure, I forgive you. God does too. And the Lord bless you. Certainly. Now, when the meeting going on, an evil spirit in the meeting, that spirit is almost harmless until it can catch somebody that it can work through. Then when it can work through, it'll certainly do damage. Because it is an evil spirit. And the Holy Spirit is here trying to find somebody to work to. And when it finds somebody to work to, it can do good. See the two spirits? Their motives, objectives. Watch how it is. Watch their works. Watch their fruits. Then you can see what spirit is on you. You are motivated by spirit. If you have no spirit, you're dead. And if you have a spirit, it motivates your life. And if your life bears the fruit of a Christian, it's a Christian spirit. Now, you may be filled. Now, what's this evil spirit? When he goes out, he walks in dry places, hunting a place to find rest. The Bible said he could not find it. So he says, I will return back to where I come out of. He goes back to this person that he was once in, and he finds the house all swept, cleaned up, sanctified, all condemnation gone. Oh, just a real happy believer. But it's empty. And he said, come here, seven other spirits worse than he was. Will you please try to get this? The 
Bible said that's the truth. Jesus said it's the truth. And he comes back to this house. A man who's confessed Christ to be his Savior has got rid of his wickedness, has quit his drinking, quit his smoking, his lying, his stealing. He has become sanctified, cleaned out. His house is all swept. He feels free. So he comes back and he finds that house. Then he goes and gets seven other spirits, worse than he was, and comes into this person. And the Bible said that the life, the state of the man, is seven times worse than it was at the beginning. Now, what does happen? A evangelist comes through. They preach repentance. And you clean up from your sin. And then when you're cleaned up, the devil goes away from you. You take your things back that you stole. You go confess your wrongs to your wife or your husband. You read really it clean up. And then the thing of it is, you're just clean and make a real good target for the devil. Now, after the people believed and was baptized, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And that's God's divine program. Now, if you are filled with the world and when you get saved, you might be filled with good thoughts and so forth, but unless you are filled with God, God sent the Holy Spirit to the earth to motivate the church. And you might be filled with thoughts. You might be filled with theology. And you might be filled with education. A know-it-all. And you might be filled with religion. And still be a target of the devil. That's right. Now, when God made you so you could empty, for when you was born, you was made with a place to be filled. By nature, you're a child of the devil. And when you, a evangelist comes along, and you repent and get cleaned up, you see what the devil comes? He brings back to you and sets you in some little denomination and say, our church is the biggest one. You're wrong right there to start with. Then you get heady, high-minded. Why don't condemn me to stay home and watch television? It doesn't condemn me to smoke a little friendly cigarette or take a drink once in a while. Your fruits tells what you are. And then you'll hear some clergyman get up and you might be reading the Bible and you see where Jesus performed and done miracles. You take it to the pastor. Oh, he'll say, now look, we don't believe that. Who's we? Who is the we don't believe it? Him and Who? It isn't him and God, for God wrote it. It's him and somebody else. And if you'll get behind it, it's the same motive that was at the Tower of Babel. To build a man-made earthly dominion. But God don't want that. He don't want you all united under the Methodist, under the Baptist, or under the... Uh, and he's ecclesiastical, a church head. He don't want you all united under Rome. He don't want you all united under the uh, any church dominion. He wants you united under his spiritual kingdom. The Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the world becomes dead. And you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And the devil is a person that has to stay away from you. You're under God's domain. You are a new creature. The Holy Spirit come into that empty place and fill it up. Now, a pastor, any cult, some little literature you'd read might say to you, 
The days of miracles is past. That's a good place for the devil to slip one of them spirits in there and make you a worse person than you was when you was a sinner. Because a religious sinner is the worst of all. That's the worst. Jesus said so. It's the worst spirit. Then you might go to a meeting where the great power of the Lord. And the first thing you'd say when you saw it, now I just wonder if I get mixed up with this, they'll give me my letter at the church. See you where you're at? Now maybe it doesn't. There's fine denominations, fine pastors, Methodists, Baptists, all different types that believe in the supernatural moving of God. That believes that man's got to be born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. And I thank God for every one of them. There's many of them that believe. God's got his children stuck out in every place. But what I'm trying to say, in the majority, you find out at all those churches, I want to ask you Methodist people something that don't believe in divine healing. What about John Wesley, your founder, when he was riding his horse to pray for a sick woman, and the horse stumbled in a gopher hole and fell and broke its leg? John got off his horse, took a bottle of oil, and said, Lord, you've made this horse the same as you made me, and anointed the horse with oil and got on him and rode away. What about that? You're preaching in a modern Methodist church today, they throw you out the door. Certainly. But you see what it is? The old mother prostitute of the Bible, Revelation 17, she had daughters. And surely I don't have to go in detail on that. Protestantism is a product of Catholicism. Certainly it is. They brought a lot of this stuff out still hanging on to it. Still doing it. Way away from scriptural teaching. Way away from the apostles' teaching. They made themselves up an apostles' creed. I want any man to tell me where the apostles ever quoted a, a, quoted a creed like that. Never, never. But you lay on to it. And you call your priest father. And Jesus said, call no man father. And you people, you get your little prayer books out, both Protestant and Catholic, and say prayers over and over and over, both Protestant and Catholic. And Jesus said, don't use vain repetitions like the heathens do, think they can be heard or they're much talking. You see, pot can't call kettle black. That's right. It's all under condemnation. Every man-made theory. And that's the reason in a revival like this come to the city, these seats are set and empty. But God will send it anyhow. And the papers will blast it. And at the day of judgment, when you're called to answer You'll be found guilty as they was back there. Didn't Jesus say the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south, come all the way from the utmost parts of the world, sitting on the back of a camel three months to see a gift of God, which was Solomon? He said, Verily I say unto you, a greater than Solomon is here. And I say tonight that a greater than Solomon is here. It's the person of Christ in the Holy Ghost. Arming and working, producing in the human life just as he did here. God made you a place that could be emptied. Now, you can't just polish the old life up. You can't give the old life a facelift. She's got to die and a new life be born in her. She don't need some manicure or what did you put on your lips? What do women do? You know, to make them look better. She don't need a hair curling. She don't need the lip stuff. The church needs a birth and a filling of the Holy Ghost. With her hair curled and her lips painted, she's still the same old girl. She still is a doubter. She still is, has her doubts. 
She has her fears. She's got herself all scrupled up and she don't want to hear the truth because the thing that is within her won't let her do it. That's right. Certainly. A woman of ill fame on the streets. You walk up and tell her, hey, woman, you're wrong. She'll say, tend to your own business. And some stiff-necked church member is seven times worse than that woman. Tell her, there's a great revival going on. You should come down. The Lord Jesus has manifested himself, healing the sick, people are so forth, receiving the Holy Spirit. Wow, what's the matter with you? I belong to church. I'm as good as you. Wow. She don't know any better. But you speak to a decent woman. And tell her it's wrong to do that. She'll say, Amen. I know that's wrong. And you tell a man or a woman that's born again of the Spirit of God that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is here for them to fill their hearts. They'll holler, Amen to it. For they feed and live on the Word of God. Certainly they do. But you see, as it is in the world, so is it in the church. They're trying to build something. God don't need your help to build His kingdom. God just wants you to preach the Word. He'll do the building. He's the architect. He's got the plans right out here. All right. What do we do then? God made you a place to empty up of the things of the world. Now, nature put a spirit in there that makes you love the things of the world, and you know you're wrong when you do that. Whether you're a church member, you may be just as religious as you can be. And just as full of the devil with it. That's right. If you doubt the Word of God, every word of it to be true, it's the devil telling you that. Certainly it is. That's rude. But it's time, high time, that some little sissified preacher got his rubber gloves off and preached the gospel the way it's wrote. And quit trying to petty around with some seminary experience. I always felt sorry for an incubator chicken. A chicken that was born in an incubator chirps and ain't got no mammy to go to. That puts me in the mind of a seminary preacher that don't know no more about the Word of God and what the seminary said. Chirping and no mammy to go to. But when you're really born under the wings of His grace and power, you'll agree with every word He said is the truth. And when God moves in the supernatural, your heart will hungry right to it. You won't get off on the side and say, mental telepathy, a devil, Beelzebub. I don't believe that. My church don't teach it. You'll say, God be praised forever. Or you're filled. You can't stay empty. Empty is idleness. That's what's the matter with the converse today. As soon as you get converted, you start idling around. You ought to be over there on your knees seeking God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be filled up. Then you've got to wall His blessed presence with you. And when the enemy comes in like the lion in the den that night with Daniel, the light of God shines out and he gets away from you. If the good man of the house hasn't got it garrisoned, certainly. Now, united, on the day of Pentecost, or just before it, the disciples had all been cleaned out. All their sins had been forgiven. And Jesus, the shepherd, the old hen as it was, as he said he would have gathered him as a hen his brood. Then when the spirit of the devil was kept away, waiting for the filling time. And yet in all that just twelve men, one of them got the anointing of the devil. And after he had seen Jesus do all those fine works, he was the very one that led the soldiers to put a rag around his head and hit him over the head with a club or a stick and say, tell us who hit you, we'll believe you. After following Jesus and seeing his miracles, and hearing the Jew come up and Jesus tell him who he was, where he'd come from. After seeing all that, 
This same man doubted it. After seeing him at the well of Samaria with the woman, tell her her sins. And you hear the Pharisees say, he's a fortune teller. And then after seeing the lovely Jesus, the woman touching his garment and being healed, he still wouldn't believe and permitted a spirit of unbelief to come to him because he was instructed on the outside. See what I mean? Oh, what a horrible thing unbelief is. And yet people profess Christianity, setting with that in them. Heady, high-minded, the Bible said in the last days. Do I feel strange about it? No, sir. It makes me know this, that the end time is at hand. For the Bible said the Spirit speaks expressly. You know what the word expressly means? That in the last days, that's this, peerless time shall come, for man shall be lovers of their self. I'm Dr. Ph.D. Jones, and my, my seminary experience, I, I have all my degrees. I'm a LLLD. Our pastor is all this, that. That don't have one thing to do with God. I had a man come not long ago, said, Brother Bram, I can plaster your wall with degrees. And it said, every time when I got my doctor's degree, I thought I'd find Christ. When I got my literature degree, when I got my bachelor degree, I hunted for Christ and all of it. And I haven't found him yet. He says, has the teacher's been wrong? I said, Christ is not known by these theological degrees, but he's known in the person of the Holy Ghost, which come down on the day of Pentecost. And the man fell across my coffee table in my dining room and there received the Holy Spirit. Amen. On the field tonight, preaching divine healing, which is one of the outstanding men of the day. What did the church do? Excommunicating. Right quick. Blessed are you when they put you out of the synagogues and things for my name's sake. What the Bible said? They'll be heady. How minded? When? In the last days. Lovers of television. Pleasures more than the lovers of God. Truce breakers, false accusers. Now, I tell you, don't you go down to that meeting because there's nothing to it. False accusers. The Bible said so. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. What power is that? The disciples asked, just a moment, the disciples asked this question. When they seen that Judas had betrayed him and everything was at hand, they said, Lord, will thou at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Watch what he said. It's not for you to know that hour, but go up to the city of Jerusalem and you shall be endued with power from on high before you can be a witness. A witness has to know something. A witness has to have an experience. And you cannot be a witness of Christ until the Holy Ghost has baptized you. Jesus would not permit his disciples to preach the gospel until they received the Holy Ghost. Yet they had been honored to walk with him three and a half years. Though they were holy men, accepted in his sight. But he would not let them read. Go preach until they waited up there and got all the differences out of them, and then the Holy Spirit came. What the world needs today is that same filling. When the dumping out comes, it needs a filling. What does that filling do when it comes in? Where you have doubt, it brings faith. Where you have indifference, it brings love. Where you have hatred, it brings fellowship. And then when the Church of the living God someday will be united under one great head, and that will be the, the head of God, God in the unity of the body of Christ will be the governor and the king and the Lord over the entire church under his control. Then she will be received up today. All of the towers of Babel they may build, all of the rockets they may find, 
all of this socialism and communism, if they may stir up, all the ecclesiastical systems will fail. But in spite of all of it, God will have a church united under his king, under his kingship by the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, speak with new tongues. If they take up serpents that which should drink any deadly thing, it will not harm them. They'll lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. Great signs and wonders, the works that I do shall they do also. Even more than this shall they do, for I'm going to the Father. A little while the world will see me no more, yet ye shall see me, for I'll be with you. What? Dump out, empty up, then I'll be in you to the end of the world, the consummation. Certainly, I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. When that spirit is in there, it takes hold of God's eternal word. And it calls everything contrary to it as though it wasn't. No matter what it takes place, how the world says, what anything else says, if God has made the promise, the man that's endued with that spirit will hold on to that promise of God. Because there's nothing else in his way. The church is pure. The church is purged by the Holy Spirit. Their conscience, the seers of doubt and unbelief is taken away. And when they hear God's word say a certain thing, they believe it. Oh, they hold on to it. They just don't move from it. And the world today, my friend, is wanting to see people that's united with Christ to display the real, genuine spirit of Christ. Gallant heroes. In closing, you might say, the world is wanting to see heroes. They honor heroes. That's good. The old saying is that cowards die a million times while heroes never die. There's a story that comes to my mind. I would like to quote it to you just for a few moments. It's a story of a hero that's too often forgotten. Many of you men, my age, and you women, you will remember it well in our school books. It was many years ago in Switzerland the little Swiss people that went up in the mountains and built themselves some houses, they had their own little economics and so forth, their little homes, and they loved them. They wasn't a warring people. They were peaceful people. And all at once, one time, coming into Switzerland was a great, powerful army. And they were well-trained men, just sitting like them seats there, just like a brick wall, great shields, great spears, well-trained war men. And they come marching into Switzerland to take what the Swiss had. And the Swiss, to guard their homes, kissing their wives goodbye and their children and babies, they took old pieces of scythe blades, rocks and stones, great big old clubs, and went out in the valley to meet the oncoming army. And when they got gathered out there, just a little bitty handful of men, and all around them, was a great marching army. What could they do? They stood hopeless, helpless, one looking at the other. They were licked. There's no way around it. They were finished. And after a while, there was a man by the name of Arnold von Winkelard. He stepped out and he said, Man of Switzerland, over across the mountain is a little white home where my wife and three little children wait. Say, when I kiss them goodbye this morning, I'll never see them again on this earth. They said, Arnold von Winklard, what are you going to do? He said, this day I shall die for Switzerland. Well, they said, Arnold von Winklard, That will do no good. Why do you say you will die for Switzerland? He said, you take what you've got, plowshares, 
little old sickles, sticks and clubs, rocks, said, you follow me, and you fight the best you can with what you've got. So what will you do? And he threw down his sickle, his thing that he was going to fight with. He raised up his hand, and he screamed to that big army. He looked around. He saw where the thickest of spears was, just everyone in uniform number, marching him right against the mountain. On, on, oh, that's the way the devil does it. Marching him right into the corner. He raised his hands, and he screamed, Make way for liberty! And the oncoming army wondered what. And he started running. And he screamed again, Make way for liberty! And when he got right into this great big bunch of spears, where many pointed to catch him, he grabbed his arms out like this and got a whole arm full of those spears and drew them into his bosom. Such a display of real heroism. It upset that big army and it routed them. Here come the Swiss with clubs and sticks and beat that army out of their nation. And they've never had a war from that time to this. Because one man played the part of a hero and did what was right. That's never been exceeded and very seldom compared with as heroism. But oh, that's such a little thing. To one day, many years ago, when Adam's children, the race of this world was backed up in the corner with sicknesses and diseases and sin. They'd been sent prophets and killed them and they'd all kinds of laws and refused them. And Adam's race was backed into the corner. There was one who stepped out of heaven and said, I'm going down to the earth this day to give my life. He found where the thickest of the darts was, the fears of Adam's race was death. He grabbed death as he went to Calvary and pulled it into his bosom. And he told his disciples, empty up now, go yonder at wait up yonder until I send you back something to fight with. Blessed be. Excuse me. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He sent the Holy Spirit and said, follow me. Cut sin and sickness to the wall. Men and women, the greatest thing that's ever been given to the church of God is not to hold some ecclesiastical paper in your hands but to be filled with God's Holy Spirit and cut the kingdom of the devil until our chief captain comes to take over. God bless you. Don't think I'm beside myself. That's true. I know what I talk of. Man of honor. Women, you who believe in God, you who claim to have the Spirit of God in your heart, if you're sick or needy, you've got the weapon there to fight that sickness with. It's in you. God gave it to you. Why will we stand back like a coward? Why will we stand on the sideline? Let's follow the captain. Let's follow him that went to Calvary. When he went to Calvary, he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we were healed. Take that what he gives you and fight sickness and sin. Fight unbelief away. Tell the devil he's a liar. Christ said he has overcome the world. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Greater is the power of Christ in you and that sickness that you have in your body tonight. Greater is the power of Christ than that little besetting sin that you can't overcome. Let's take that Holy Spirit and fight the devil down and walk out victorious as the heroes of the cross. Let us pray. Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, we come in Jesus' name. We come because he said, ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Here's a little bunch of people here tonight who are staggering along, trying to keep under the banner, and the devil's hissing at them. They look out there at that great walled army that's all around them. And tell him the days of miracles is past and there's no such thing. Oh, Lord God, 
May they grab that hold of that eternal life that sealed their heart, the Holy Spirit. And if He hasn't sealed them, may He do it right now. May all the doubts vanish. And may this little body of people tonight be filled with God's filling power to take the place of unbelief and doubt and give them faith and love and happiness and joy and the Holy Spirit to lay hold of that promise that God gave like Abraham of old and call the things that are not as though they were because God said so. Grant it, Lord, while we have our heads bowed. Everywhere in this building. I wonder if there'd be a person here without the Holy Spirit tonight would say, Oh, Lord, be merciful to me. I'm ashamed that I'm hanging around these towers of man-made ecclesiastical systems, of all this doubt and things that they produce with it. Lord, take me out of this dominion tonight and place me into your dominion by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want it now, Lord. Give me faith to believe for my healing. Give me faith to believe my sins are gone and all these things. Give me faith so that the Holy Spirit will come into me and just overflood my soul with joy. Would you raise your hands to him and say, I want to receive it. God bless you, lady. God bless you, 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 you. All over the building. God bless you back there, lady. I'm waiting. God's watching. And you over here, all this row in here. Yes, God bless you. I want the Holy Spirit. I'm tired going around a halfway life. Tippers and fusses and stews and doubts and fears is all in my heart, Brother Branham. But I want it all out. I want to be a place where I can be a shining light. I want me to be, my life to be like Stephen's. How he was fearless. He said his face shined like an angel. He wouldn't have to have a glaring light. An angel would be stern and know what he was talking about. He stood before that Sanhedrin court and said, You stiff necks, uncircumcised the heart and ears, you resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did. So do you. He was an angel. He had a message. The word angel means messenger. Give me, a, make me a messenger, Lord, of the divine power of Christ by the Holy Ghost in my heart. Would you raise your hand? Someone else who hasn't. The blessing's on you, sir. Blessings on you, young lady. God bless you, young man. The Lord sees you. Good. All right, now with your heads bowed, let's pray for God to fill you with the Holy Ghost right where you are. Brother Bram, you want to come down and lay your hands on me for the Holy Ghost? I don't have to. While Peter spake these words at the house of Cornelius, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word. Faith cometh by hearing. Not laying on of hands, but by hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. And I've tried in my humble way to show you the towers that's being built, the Babylon towers, that's got to fall. And I'm pointing you to a tower, and there's only one road up it, that's through the Holy Spirit. You can't set neutral. The Bible said in this day that every man that wasn't sealed with the Holy Ghost would have the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Unbelief. Don't you know what their, if your pastors had taught you in the Old Testament when the trumpet sounded, if the man wanted to go free, he could go free. If he didn't, he walked to the post and had an all bowed to his ear because he refused to go free. And if you refuse to go free, then you'll serve that taskmaster the rest of your days and your lost. What's the seal of God, Brother Branham? The Holy Ghost. You say, is that scriptural? Absolutely. Many of them. Let me give you one so you won't forget it. Ephesians 4.30 said, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed till the day of your redemption. There's the seal of God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You've looked for the seal of God to come in the last days, not on your forehead. Saying it was on your forehead is your knowledge to understand. But the Bible said the seal of God is the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And everybody has it, their hearts are free. They're sealed by the knowledge of God in their forehead that they do know that Jesus is dead and raised again because they can see him. A little while the unbeliever will see me no more, yet you'll see me, the one's got the seal. For I'll be with you even in you to the end of the world. The works that I do shall you also even greater than this, for I go to my Father. 
The unbelieving world walks along in gross darkness around some Tower of Babel. A touch, and there's something other around some superstition, some cult. While the real believer in the signs and wonders, and it's hid from the eyes of the unbeliever. Open your hearts now and let him come in. I'm going to ask the ministers also in the buildings, pray especially at this time. This is a great moment. This moment will seal the destination, no doubt, of many. One soul worth 10,000 worlds. How great is this moment. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, Jehovah, reach down just now by the mercies of the Lord Jesus, the blessed one, and pour the holy oil of your spirit into every heart here. Those who are hungry, it is written in the Bible, while Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them. No wonder. They were all thirsty. You said, blessed are ye when you hunger and thirst for righteousness, for you shall be filled. How can we speak to people about Christ when they're not thirsty for him, when they're sitting in their man-made thoughts and satisfied, knowing not that they're miserable, wretched, blind, and poor, and know it not? God, be merciful tonight to those who are raising their hands, those who are willing for the Holy Spirit to come in. May he come Come down the streams of his blessings now, pouring into every heart and filling them to an over, overrunning joy that they might know that he lives. Give them understanding of how to accept him. Give them understanding that you're there more anxious to get in their heart than they are to have you. May every little funny feeling, every demon that's sitting around hissing, now you won't receive it, you won't receive it. May they call that devil a liar. God made the promise. And God will keep his promise. But how can we when we sit all pulled in like a terrapin in its shell? I pray, God, that you'll loosen up this crowd of people and send down the Holy Spirit from on high with a great powerful rush up on them. May their hearts be open now. And if they can only receive the Holy Spirit, Lord, he will announce to them that all blessings of God belongs to them. Grant it, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Don't you love him? You believe that this is the truth? I'm not much of an ecclesiastical preacher, I, but what I, if I could only express what I see in my heart. I see the end time. I know the message is true. If I was dying this hour, the message is true. Okay? And I believe that the eyes of the people many times are blinded. But God is just. In every age, he sent Noah. How many were saved? How many were saved in the days of Lot? Jesus said, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Certainly. Just a few. But the message went on just the same. Now listen. How many believe that God is here? Let's see your hand. How many believe that He's Jehovah Rapha, the Lord's provided sacrifice? How many believe that He's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord that healeth thee? Listen, friends. Too many times my ministry in America hasn't been very forceful because it looks like the people are so, so confused. One teaches one thing and one another. Instead of sitting down and taking the Bible and reading it for yourself see, and being convinced by the Holy Spirit. Now, look, you don't need, you've been taught people lay hands on you. That's all right. My ministry is to witness the evidence of Jesus Christ raised from the dead. Now, some of you thought it was mental telepathy. You wrote your letters in today and said so. Last night... I took the people that had the prayer cards and turned them away and just got the ones without prayer cards. Friend, let me say to you as a servant of Christ, here's such Jean and Leo, my bosom friend. Here's Dr. Vale, my son Billy. There's Brother Sopman, the Canadian manager. Brother, uh, Brother Norman, the one that's got this meeting up. Many men, call my city. Call the mayor of the city. Mr. Hudenpal, call the judge. Call the police force. Call Dr. Sam Adair, the greatest doctor in the South, the big clinic. 
Ask them what kind of, what visions take place. Ask them if it's true. Call Dr. Sam at every night and ask him what he does when he gets in a hard place. He comes up to my house, gets down on his knees, and there he lays before God, he and I, so God shows a vision and asks him if ever one time it fails. Call him at my expense, Dr. Sam Adair. Runs a big clinic there. Asked him how he ever got the clinic there when he's up in my house crying and said the city needs a clinic. And I told him right where to be built and he had built it. He said, you, you can't buy that place. He said, 25 years from now. It's in courts in Boston. I said, thus saith the Lord, it'll be yours before 24 hours. Now I said, you'll have a clinic there. It'll be made out of red brick. You'll have a sign at the door and so forth and like that. He said, Billy, I wouldn't doubt you for nothing, son. I said, the Lord has given it to you, doctor. Call him tonight and ask him what's taking place. The next morning he called me and said, I'm freezing to death. They just called me and something happened last night. I've bought the place already. Ask about cases that he sends up there with cancer. Eat up. No hope at all. We'll pray over him. He'll run me out of the hospital. We'll go into the room and shut the door. The Lord will show a vision, either saying just when they're going or just what will happen. Ask him if it ever fails. This is just minor here. This is, the, this is the least I've ever seen done in any of my meetings. That's right. I've tried everything to get the thing broke. I come up, then you thought prayer cards. I turn the prayer cards around. I'm trying everything. I'm here as your servant and your brother. These things here, here's Banks Wood sitting here somewhere, my book salesman. Leo Jean, here's two boys here, one a Catholic and the other and I don't think belong to anything. When they come to Hammond, Indiana, and seen the Holy Spirit and them thousands of people calling out a, f- a few years ago, one of them grew a great big beard. They formed themselves an FBI of their own to come down and see if them things is right. Come up to my house and pose as evangelists and so forth. And the Holy Spirit went right down and called it out. <laughs> here they are sitting here now. See? Why can't you stand it? What's the matter? Mr. Woods, he's here somewhere, tell me, sitting right here. Way down in Louisiana, I saw him getting hurt. Called him on the phone and told him to watch. The next day, he cut his thumb off. He cut his arm off, the Holy Spirit. A few nights ago, when he was in Chicago, I seen him in a business of smoke and told him to be careful. He'd have got lead poison right there and went in that bunch of smoke and like to died right there. That's how things are foretold weeks after weeks and months after months before they ever happen. Later on in the week, I'll show you what this is. This is your own faith, and that's the reason things can't take place. It's you pulling from the Holy Spirit. But Jesus never seen a vision for the woman. It was her faith that touched him. That's the reason he got weak. It's your faith that does it, not mine. It's you that's doing it. And if you can get them spooky feelings away from you and really believe God, this thing will break out into one great big hallelujah revival. And the lame blind halt and everything will take place. But as long as you set cooped up, how can he do it? I believe in being conservative. But not only that, that conservative thing gives you a spirit of superstition. Don't tell me. I'm standing here now. I know what I'm speaking of. The Holy Spirit's right in this building right now. will heal every one of you right where you're sitting, if you'll believe it. He's already done it. How many believes that? Do you believe it? All right. I'll see how much you believe. Bow your heads just a moment. Lay your hand on somebody near you. Now, just get away from every superstition. You're under the dominion of Christ. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in their midst. You might call me a hypocrite, but you'll find out in a minute. I see people right now being healed. That's right, right now. You might not recognize it right now, but if pastors in this building don't see people coming to them after I'm gone, tell them that stomach troubles and things like that left them, I'm a false witness. That's right. That's right, I see it. I'm watching it now in another world. You believe. You believe, sure, if a poor, ignorant, hot and tot in Africa that doesn't even know which is right or left hand can accept it, what about you who can read the Bible and been taught in Christianity? If that poor fellow has to believe just one time looking at it, because I've got to go somewhere else the next day, and thousands raised out of wheelchairs and crippled and blind, and what about you? Oh, God, how merciful you are. How long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. Now sit closed in with God. Confess your sins. Confess your unbelief. Tell God you're ashamed of yourself of your unbelief. I challenge you to do that, and you'll see the glory of God. 
I feel anointed right now to do something different than I've ever have done. I've never did this in my life, but I feel led to do it right now. Confess your sin right now. You say, well, I'm a Christian. Confess your unbelief. Tell Christ that you'll never disbelieve him again. Right now, you're accepting him. Right now, it's going to be over. You'll never go to complain about it anymore. No matter what it looks like, what it feels like, you're going to believe it. Because God said so. God said so. You come out of Babylon's tower. You come out in the valley. Where the lily of the valley is at. You come to the mountainside. Where the grace of God is flowing freely from the fountain of life. Confess your faults. Say, God, if you've done anything to somebody, say, I'll go back and make it right. Do that now. I want each one of you now, as I pr- say this prayer, I want you to pray it. You say it out loud with me. I'm just going to say it, but you pray it from your heart. With your head bowed, eyes closed, everybody. Don't raise your head till I say so. I'm just looking to see what I can see. Say this behind me. Almighty God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, giver of every good gift, be merciful to me, O God. Forgive my unbelief. I believe the gospel. I believe that you're here. I believe that you're now performing your word in my body. Open the channels. I empty out my unbelief. I receive your spirit. I believe that you're in me now. I believe my sickness will vanish. How can death and life exist in my body when you're in there? I believe you and I accept you now as my healer. Now keep your head bowed. That's your prayer. That's your prayer. Now I'm going to pray for you. Keep shut in. Keep shut in with God. Don't get nothing else on your mind now. He's right with you. Right there by your side. You say, I want the Holy Ghost, Brother Branham. All right, he's right there to give it. You say, I want healing in my eyes, Brother Branham. He's right there to give it. I want my baby healed. He's right there to do it. I want my brother and my mother. He's right there to do it. Right there. Jehovah Jireh, the provided sacrifice. Now, I'm going to pray for you. The Bible said the prayer of faith shall save the sick. God shall raise them up. If I found grace in your sight by the working of the Holy Spirit, I'll pray with all my heart right now that the Holy Spirit will witness to you that the work is finished. Oh God, my Father, I come in Jesus' name to pray for this people who has now honestly and sincerely have confessed their wrongs. Oh, blessed God, may this be a night that they'll never forget. May the Holy Spirit come into every heart just now. And just move out all, everything and all the sickness from their body. I now challenge the devil to a debate. Satan, you are aware that you are whipped. You have no legal right. Jesus Christ, my Lord, stripped you of every authority you had when he died at Calvary to take away sin and sickness. And you're nothing but a bluff. And we're calling your bluff. You know that when our Lord came to the tree, he cursed the tree. The next day it was withering. And our Lord said to his disciples, have faith in God. For if ye shall say, ye shall say to this mountain, be moved. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe what you have said is coming to pass. You can have what you said. Satan, you know the scripture on that. And I've just taught this people that God is in them. And if God is in them and they speak to that disease and say, be away from me and don't doubt in their heart, right then that disease has to move. For Christ said so. For it's not them that speak. It's the Father that dwells in them that's speaking. They're in need. So come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. I say as God's servant. 
by a message from an angel who anointed and has proved to the people that Jesus is here. And the message is right, so come out of them in the name of Jesus Christ. I adjure you to leave every sick person and get into outer darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? I'm sure you heard that. How many heard that great roar go through the building just then? That was it. Surely you won't doubt any longer. That was God speaking back. Can't you see? Rise. Do you believe you're healed? Do you believe that God answered prayer? Raise your hands to Him. Thank Him for it. It's over. You're healed. Jesus said, If ye shall say, What is it? When you are out from Babylon, you are out from under unbelief, you are out from under superstitions, you are out from under all these things, and you are filled with God's own life, your voice is His voice. You are. I spoke it in my room a while ago. God told me to do this. And here it is. He's confirmed it right now. Amen. And blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, what a time. That's the first time that's happened since South Africa. How long will you grope in unbelief? Get that? The wind swept through this platform here. Just now as the Holy Spirit crossed over here because it was the spoken Word of God that did it. Amen. How many of you feel? Raise your hands. How many feel different in your body? Raise your hands. There it is. You are now healed by the glory of God. All that feels different. If you couldn't move your arm, move it. If you couldn't hear out of your ear, stick your finger in your ear and listen. You can hear. If you couldn't walk, stand to your feet. If you're blind, take off your shades from your eyes. You can see. The Holy Spirit passed through this place just now in a confirmation of the Word. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A wind like went over the building. How many could feel that when it went through here? Raise your hands. Be honest with yourself. That wind that passed through the building, that's the Holy Spirit. Say it, and it shall be done. Like a great loving wind went right down across the here, and I heard it as it crossed over the audience. You heard it and felt it too. It's His presence. All now that feel different. All now that feel that you're healed. All now that feels that Christ is in you. What was that? Just like the Holy Spirit come on the day of Pentecost. Come right down the wind that swept over here. How many is a witness of it? Raise your hand. Everyone, I'm honest from your heart. There it is. It swept right through the building just then. It's the same Holy Ghost. The same Holy Spirit comes by the same Word. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. All that believe that you're healed, stand on your feet. Everyone that believes that you feel different, yet that you're right now healed, stand on your feet. Amen. Amen. That's it. Amen. While they're waiting, as you begin to feel different, if you had a headache, if it's gone, stand up. If you were sick at your stomach, stand up if it's gone. Stand up as a witness. There you are. What does it do? It's the Holy Ghost that did it. Amen. Filled with His goodness. Oh, my. This is my story. This is my story. Oh, don't you feel good? Oh, this is my song. Everybody, praise Him, I say. All the day long, this is my story, oh, this is my song, praise thee, my Savior, all the day long. Let's sing it again, everybody, pick it up. This is my story. Oh, this is my song. Everybody, praise my Savior all the day long. This is my.
my story. All this is my song. Praise my Savior. Oh. How does it feel to be healed? Wave your hands to him. How it feel to be healed? Just look at there. Tell me the devil ain't defeated. Certainly he is. Amen. He's wonderful. Oh my, give us a few to wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. How many know that song, Wonderful, Wonderful Jesus is to me? Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. All right, give it to sister. All right. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus. Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God is He. Oh, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful, my Redeemer, praise. Oh, wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Oh, Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is He. Oh, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer. Praise For the benefit of there might be a doubter standing by, which I feel it in my heart now and against my spirit. Someone's thinking that that roar that went through just then was caused by a plane or something. God, who is my solemn judge, that spirit come across this platform and even fanned my coat by my side and roared out over that building right there. I felt it, seen it as it went out. How many is a witness? Now, the Bible said in the mouth of two or three witnesses. It's absolutely not. It's the Holy Spirit. You remember when Jesus was praying one time and there was a roar come from heaven? How many remembers that? And some of them said, oh, something of thundered or something like that. That still skeptic spirit still is. But God still lives too. He's right here. The same rushing mighty wind that come down from heaven on the day of Pentecost is right here to witness that same thing again. God Almighty is the judge of all things. Amen. Do you love him? Praise the Lord. All right. Everybody reach over and shake hands with one another while we sing wonderful again. You Methodists and Baptists make up now. All right. Oh, wonderful. Oh, turn right around. Shake hands with everybody around. Me, Counselor, the Prince of Peace, the mighty God is He. Oh, saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Oh, wonderful is my redeeming praise His name. Praise the Lord. You feel good now? All over, all doubts is gone. Wave your hands to Him. It's all gone. All doubts is gone. Oh, my. Wonderful. Wonderful. Good. All doubts is gone. God bless you. Dr. Bale.